Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkshire, host, and our guest is Kaveh Madani, who is currently at the Macmillan Center as a Henry Hart Rice Senior Fellow. Professor Madani is an environmental scientist, educator, and activist who works at the interface of science, policy, and society. He previously served as deputy head of Iran's Department of Environment and is known for his role in raising public awareness about water and environmental problems there. Today we'll talk with Professor Madani about environmental security in the Middle East. Welcome, Professor Madani. Thanks for having me. So you um, have been working uh, in the environmental arena for a while now, and I'm curious to know what drew you to be interested in that. Uh, I grew up in a water family. My parents worked for the water sector in Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the only child. They had no choice by t but taking me to trips and missions, and I grew up learning about a lot of water problems uh, mm -hmm. around the country, lots of projects and so on, and that's what got me into um, the water resources field. Mm -hmm. um, I got trained as an engineer, water resources engineer, and, and over time I, I tried to pay attention to some other uh, dimensions of water problems and, and why uh, with so much talent in, for example, my home country and the rest of the region, uh, so many infrastructure in place and, and so many good projects, um, still the region is suffering from serious uh, water and environmental problems and, and that was the main motivation um, still um, trying to figure out what's what's going on. Right, right. So things um, in Iran are, are pretty bad at this point um, with the scarcity of water. Um, so let's let's not only talk about Iran but also elsewhere in the Middle East. What is the actual situation environmentally in terms of water? So when we talk about water and the Middle East, um, you know, we always know Middle East as a, as a um, dry region. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of oil, a lot of gas, but not much uh, water. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so, so naturally this region of the world um, is, is having problems, struggling with, with water. Now, when you go from one country to, to another situation can be uh, different. Mm -hmm. As we are speaking uh, today, um, people in north of Iran are struggling with a heavy um, snowfall, and, and you know a lot of people think that that Middle East is is fully dry deserts and camels. Mm -hmm. No, it, there is variability there. But but as a, you know, when we look at the region as a whole, um, they don't get as much precipitation as the rest of the world, mm -hmm. um, so they're short on, on their water water budget. Now, as the rest of the world, they want to drink, shower, and, and clean, and run their industry, and most importantly, grow food and run their agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the main, main problem of the Middle East, that they don't have enough water for produ producing food based on their business as usual right, plans. Right. Um, they can do much better, they can do things much more efficiently, um, if, if they reform their plans and do a better job. So what we are seeing right now today is declining aquifer levels across the, you know, the region, drying wetlands and, and lakes and rivers, um, resulting in dust storms. Uh, groundwater drawdown is, is resulting in land subsidence, sinkholes, and a lot of problems that we, we are seeing, which some of them are emerging and, and new actually and mm -hmm. unprecedented. In, in the Middle East and, and causing a lot of trouble. Such I don't, as what? Um, so, so, so like, for example, dust storms. So parts of the, regions, uh, ha, the region have ha, had dust storms in the past, mm -hmm. but right now we are seeing, you know, shutdown of, of cities because of, of, of dust storms. And when dust comes, I have, I have experienced that. When, when dust comes, it's not only that, like, you know, you, you get problems with being outside and cannot, you know, you know the, the the air in, on those issues. We have had episodes where where dust sits on, on for example, electricity grids, uh, then there is a blackout, right. and as a result of a blackout, the water, water supply uh, units stop working and water treatment plants can't work, so as a result of a dust storm, then you have no water, 
no no electricity, no life right, in, right. in cities, and of course a lot of health problems. Mm -hmm. So this is just one example of so many examples around the region where, where people are heavily affected. People lose their jobs because of the lack of water. Uh, farmers have to migrate. They, they move from one location to another. And most importantly, we see tensions and economic um, suffering and, and a lot of conflicts between inside inside the you know the countries over over water transfer projects mm -hmm. over um, different dam building and reservoir building projects and and so on so water is kind of tied to the life of people tied to the economy of the people and that is why the situation is so so bad right right yeah you cannot have life without water so um, it is something that I think uh, you know probably should be pretty um, prevalent in most people's lives and thinking about it. And I'm curious to know if that is the truth. Are they aware of the scarcity of water? So, so again, I, I think, you know, there is one thing called scarcity. The other thing is like, you know, having a low budget. Mm -hmm. And my, my thinking is that, that the Middle East can do much better with the available water. They can afford having a you know, better economy, mm -hmm. work on their, w use their water for the right purpose. Right. The problem we have had in the Middle East is, is, is in some of the countries, uh, we're, we're having oil-based economies. So, mm -hmm. so you, you got plenty of, of money through, through, you know, you can earn uh, plenty of money through your natural resources by selling your oil and gas. Then you, you have, not ha have not planned well for your, your agriculture and water sector. Essentially, heavy subsidies have been given to the farmers to grow food and, and not, not, you know, good plans are not there. Mm -hmm. Then they, they always have had the fear, for the right, per, I think, for the right reasons, about food insecurity, being dependent on other nations for, for importing their food. Right. So they have tried to grow this, this sector without good plans and, and without thinking that water can be a limit to the growth. As a result, then we are seeing farmers who are suffering, mm -hmm. then we are say, seeing that food security plans are failing, and, and then environmental damages are there. People, though, might not feel this scarcity, if you will, or, mm -hmm. or what I call a water bankruptcy, and it's simply a mismatch between the available water and the use, mm -hmm. um, because they get the, to eat their food, they get their, their water through their taps, and, 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 and they don't feel it. Now, in some parts of the region, like Jordan, like um, Palis the Palestinian territories, mm -hmm. we are, you know, people are suffering and they're seeing this impact. In some other places, no, because we desalinate, we move water, mm -hmm. we, we transfer water, we store water, we take water out of the ground, and they don't feel it. And part of the problem is, is the fact that I think not only the Middle, Middle Eastern societies, but also their politicians have not yet believe, you know, found out the fact or, or admitted this, you know, wanted to accept this fact. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a shortage to deal with, and, and it's not how much money you have, it's not like how, mu how much infrastructure and engineering talent you have. This problem needs to be dealt with in a different way. In, in a different right, way. Right, okay. And also, I imagine tensions in the region, the Middle East region in general, and wars also play into this, this paradigm. Very good question, because, uh, you know, the, uh, with, with what we have see, seen in the recent years and over the recent, especially the recent decade in the, in the Middle East, our Western reading of the case mm -hmm. is, I think, um, very misleading what we hear from the media and, and some um, analysts an of the region is that, um, for example, drought has caused or created ISIS or has caused all the problems in, in Syria mm -hmm. or climate change has been the cause of the Arab Spring and, and, and things like that. Or, for example, in Iran, strikes and, and demonstrations have been because of water or water shortage. Water, as well as other environmental problems, the problems are nim not limited to water because in the Middle East we're dealing with air pollution, with deforestation, mm -hmm. with, with biodiversity losses, with, with, with waste, with tons of pr environmental problems, you name it. Like whatever is out there, with, you know, unfortunately the region is suffering from. Now, uh, yes, these problems can worsen the situation of the people, 
can result in job losses, can function as catalysts to tension. But the other side of this story that we don't appreciate when it comes to the Middle East, as well as some parts of the developing world, is that wars, lack of stability, tensions, conflicts, sanctions, and all these together create a situation where natural systems cannot really fix their economy, work in the, on their economy, do a better job to transfer the pressure from the agricultural sector to other sectors. So when, when a country goes through tension, then they, it, it cannot really plan well for, for reforming its agricultural sure. sector or environmental sector. So the tensions in the Middle East are causing environmental degradation. And this is something we don't appreciate and we don't talk about. We are afraid of the future of the region, talking about what can climate change do to the region and how it can cause migration. We don't talk about how the current tension in the region is causing environmental degradation. And the fact that if we want to prevent more environmental damages, we need more economic stability. We need to, you know, peace in the region and we need to work on the, those issues as a prerequisite to what is happening. And unfortunately, we are missing those components. Okay, so um, those are, are pretty big things to work on. Um, so if, what else can be done? What are, what are your thoughts on what else can be done in order to, to try and move things in the right direction? Essentially, if, if, if it's about like us helping them or you know, it's, it's about understanding the truth on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's, it's understanding that Middle Eastern leaders uh, are not all stupid. Uh, farmers in the Middle East are similar to farmers around the world. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they work to earn money uh, and they produce food. Mm -hmm. it's, nothing is, is, is different. Now, it is easy to say that change your economic, you know, make economic reforms, mm -hmm. um, decouple your economy from oil, decouple your economy from, from water. But, but this transition path has to be defined and it has to be enabled. If we want to, want to prevent environmental degradation in the Middle East, then we have to work on, on building institutions. We have damaged the institutions, the social structures that have been formed around natural resources. We are talking about civilizations which are thousands, you know, the, sure. you know for, for thousands of years have functions. All these modernization, um, wars and tension and invasions and so on have resulted in this, the destruction of these um, institutions. So now if we want to prevent environmental degradation, we have to understand that it's, you know, peace environmental sustainability, uh, economic stability come together as a package. So you cannot single out the environmental sector and say, go do this for the environmental mm -hmm. sector. Because if you want to fix the environmental problems, you have to figure out, you have to realize that the root causes of the environmental problems are normally out of the environmental sector. And if you want to address those, you have to work on other sectors. We understand how cap, you know, the, the capitalist system is affecting our, our environmental sector. So if you want to solve the problems, we cannot continue with the current economic model that we have. The Middle East relies on water, land, and other natural resources to create jobs. Unemployment is something that all governments around the world, including the government of the United States, is afraid, are afraid of. Mm -hmm. so, so to create jobs, to keep people happy, to keep people silent, and, and to prevent migration to, to urban areas and to prevent tension, governments are willing to bribe and spend their natural resources for their citizens, to the citizens, to prevent wars and conflicts. So in the short term, you degrade the environment because you want to help the people and, and keep your power. In the long run, you create problems that in the, the interconnected world have global implications. So if you understand the global implications of the problems in that particular region of the world, we'd better do our assignment in a better way, understand what is going on, and understand how our decisions can impact them. Mm -hmm. so Understanding that is one thing, of course, but the practicality of how do you how do you turn that around? So, so to, if you if you want to turn that around, you understand that uh, you know you you pay to the root, pay attention to the root causes. Unfortunately, we don't do that. We mm -hmm. we saw we saw terrorism 
and then we invade a country, we attack a country and try to solve that problem, then we make a country more unstable, then there is environmental degradation. If you understand that extremism is because of being poor, is because of lack of education, is because of lack of jobs and so on, then you realize that maybe to prevent terrorism, maybe to prevent uh, these sorts of conflicts, mm -hmm. to avoid future problems, then you need to invest in education, in creating jobs, in helping these economies flourish and do a better job and, and change their path. Mm -hmm. So this is our role. Now it's also the governments of the region having roles. It's, it's not the responsibility of the United States or Europe to, to help mm -hmm. the countries in the regions. The, the, the region. We have to also remind those countries about the mistakes that we have made on this part of the world. I always say that you know California is a perfect example for the Middle Eastern to learn from, Middle Easterns to learn from because in California we have done a lot of good jobs, but we have made a lot of mistakes as well. Mm -hmm. And and the, the developing world can learn from those mistakes and avoid them. And we have to highlight those and talk about those and tell them how we can you know why. Providing water is one thing and controlling demand is another thing. Providing water and building dams and digging deeper and, and building desalination plants and recycling and reuse is one thing. Having plans for your economic sector, having plans for your industrial sector is another thing. So, so, so the governments of the region also need to understand that this is not a sustainable model the, and, and the fact that you cannot make sectors secure separately. The governments of the region have focused on making their, environment, their food system secure, right? I don't want to be dependent on the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I produce oil. I want the rest of the world to be dependent on my oil, but I don't want my food to be dependent on the rest, you know, the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Why? Because then when it comes to the time of sanctions, sure. changing the oil prices, then I, I, I jeopardize my situation. So then you want to make your food system secure, then you create water insecurity problems, right. human insecurity problems. So we have to understand that we live in an interconnected world. We are dealing with wicked problems. There are lots of trade-offs and uncertainties that we need to deal with. And if you try to solve the problems within small sectors, then we create unintended consequences as we have seen in the region. We want to build a dam to help the people, then we create environmental damages. Right. We want to transfer water to for agriculture, then we dry up a lake and cause dust storms. Mm -hmm. We want to you know, build a city which is one of the best cities in the world and, and, you know, a big capital and put an airport there and, you know, bring a lot of people, tourists and so on, then we create waste issues and air pollution issues and traffic issues and so on. Mm -hmm. Because we don't understand that everything is connected and the root causes and the solutions of the environmental sector in many cases are out of the environmental sector. So environmental experts on their own, water experts on their own, water managers and, and environmental managers on their own would not be able to solve their problems and address their problems. The economy of the Middle East, their model of development need to change and they have to understand that the, the, the model that they have adopted, the dreams of, 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 of you know, build, the dreams of competing with the older United States model to have the tallest, biggest and, and largest buildings, malls and so on would not give their people the stability they deserve and their environment would not be sustainable under the current circumstances and according to the current plans. So what do you, with that said, what do you think the future holds for the Middle East? Um, so I, I think we would have the issue of the limit to growth problem. Uh, so we do not, unfortunately, proactively avoid problems. I've been on government, on a, you know, on a government. I know how governments functions, uh, functions, uh, governments function. I know that for a government which is four years in, in office, no matter where in the world, the problems that are urgent are more important. And and when I have problems like unemployment, wars with 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 other countries in the regions, war with with the Western powers, and lots of other things, environment is just a luxury problem to deal with later on. So I know that I think that we would not see that that governments in the region proactively address their environmental problems. What we see is that limited growth. 
we, we've created a problem, then we, we put a band-aid on it, we go to the next problem, to the next problem, to the next problem, and it's, it's just learning by doing and, and once, you know, addressing problems after failing. That is why that it, this is, this is uh, maybe a, a paradox, but, but I, pre I appreciate some of the natural crises and extreme events that appear um, in, under the radar of, of the politicians. Because once they see a place under fire, once they see a, a real problem, once they see a place flooded, once they see a big drought, then there is a window of opportunity to take actions. Mm -hmm. Look at California and what, how, how much they accomplished during five years of drought. Um, and, and, and look at South Africa and what they accomplished during their, you know, when they got close to their day zero. The same applies to the Middle East. You can, we can t talk about climate change forever while well, well, people might, might not realize it. But a fire, a flood, a big snowfall, you know, snowstorm, and, and lots of extreme events help them realize. Unfortunately, the cost of this is huge. Right. And, and relying on nature to teach us lessons can be very costly because people can die, people can lose law, lives and, and, and jobs and, and the economic damage and death toll can be huge but unfortunately this is the model that we go with what we can do though is to put that information out there to come up with right, the right narratives about the Middle Eastern mm -hmm. environmental problems I strongly believe that the Middle Eastern environmental security problems have been misunderstood the, the, the scientists have not done a good job uh, about it, we, we simply overlooked it. The, the regional uh, governments have not looked at it and the intelligence and security and military community have also misunderstood it. Even today, the view of environmental security problems, the perspective is very, um, I would say, you know, we look at those problems with a military lens, with, with, it, with any, you know, security lens in, in a very traditional mm -hmm. form we don't understand the interconnectedness. We, we, we understand the, the connection of environmental degradation to human security. Well, um, we don't pay attention to the environmental degradation problem, uh, I'm sorry, to, to the human societal degradation problem on the environmental mm -hmm. security. This, it, we're dealing with a reinforcing loop, right. a feedback loop, which is very frustrating. Yes. And, and if you don't understand, these situations, if you put out reports, if you rely on the media headlines which, which try to climatize every event in the region, which try to blame everything on natural resources, not the governments of the region, which try to, to, to exaggerate about some problems, and, and then, you know, this misinformation and narratives not only confuses us, but also the region mm -hmm. and the people in the region who don't know what, what to do. So we need to do our science better, at least as, as a scientist at a university, this is what I can do, also go out and talk about it, speak about these problems and inform the rest of the world. About so the message really needs to be um, a little bit more straightforward than it has been. I think we, we first need to understand, you know, put the facts together and understand what is going on. We need to understand that yes, climate change is a big threat. And as, as a person who has been involved in, in, in working on climate change, I want the, the, the leaders in the region to pay attention as much as I want the, the leaders in the United States mm -hmm. to pay attention to it. But we also need to understand the, that the human dimension of the problem, the anthropogenic impacts at the local level created by governments, created by, by, by development plans and, and, and the lack of foresight into the future. We have to get the narrative right first, based on scientific facts, not the jargon that we hear. And, and then once we have a, a, a solid base for our analysis, go out and come up with the right narrative, speak about it, take it to the international in, intergovernmental agencies, take it to, to media, and, and, and then take a proper decision, which not only help that part of the world, helps that part of, part of the world, but also the rest of the world, because in this interconnected world, the, our environmental problems don't recognize our geographical boundaries right. and political boundaries. They travel across regions and generations. The, the future generations in the region would suffer from what has happened in recent years, mm -hmm. from the you know, farmers who have left their, their lands um, because of war and couldn't farm, and now they, you know, their lands is a source of dust storms. 
and because of the, all the degradation, because of air pollution, because of increasing you know, health risks and, and health problems in, in the region. We have to understand that these things can be transferable and transferred. As we are talking and speaking, we are dealing with one problem in China, coronavirus. Right. And we had no, probably, no analysis whatsoever. And we had no expectation of something with this magnitude interrupting the whole world, the economic mm -hmm. you know, flows between the countries. Right. Now countries having problems selling their oil to, to China. And now farmers in the neighboring countries having problems selling their watermelon to China. So people are losing jobs. Um, economies are suffering because of an outbreak of, of, of a disease in some part of the world. If we understand and appreciate this interconnectedness, a lot of our approaches would be different. And if we understand that at the end of the day, we are after human security and no system can be secured without securing and, and paying attention to the balance between environmental sector, economic sector, social sector, pol political sector, education, health, etc then we won't put a military lens on, you know, on for every problem and, and we treat some problems differently. It's not all about how much, you know, you know, it doesn't matter how many missiles the Iranians have. It doesn't matter how many, true, how many soldiers the Americans have in the region. If, if the environment is not there, if there is no water, if people cannot, you know, live, live there, it doesn't matter who runs the system and how, how, how much in love the governments of that region are with the government of the United States or the rest of the world. We have to understand these realities that we don't pay attention to, but all the time we are, we are talking about governments which are in, 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 in office for a short, for short, for a short mm -hmm. period of time and don't think about the future. They think about what keeps them in power right. and what gets them reelected. And that's the problem, basically. The clock is ticking, I feel, and I think um, you know, change needs to happen sooner rather than later. Uh, only informed societies, um, I think, can identify their pro problems correctly and, 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 and select leaders who would address their, their uh, problems. When, when the leader, you know, to have people in a society which cares about the environment, you need leaders who care about the environment uh, to educate them. And, yes. and to have leaders who care about the environment, you need um, a, a, a society uh, which cares about the environment and select those who care, you know, right. select leaders who would address those problems. Now, this is a chicken and egg problem. What we can do about this is to inform them and understand that, it, that even in dictatorships, even in dictatorships where the na alternative narratives are blocked and, and you don't want the societies to, to go with any other scenario or believe any other narrative, you can make a change once the society you know, challenges its, its government, right. challenges its, its leaders about problems. And we have seen this. Mm -hmm. We have seen a growing attention to environmental problems in the region, a growing attention of the the leaders also and actually a growing frustration of the leaders who now think that maybe environment is another sector that can be used in wars, in, it can be used for political purposes and so on. We have seen the crackdown of the environmentalists in, in, a, in, in, a, in a group of environmentalists in Iran. Mm -hmm. We are seeing other things similar examples in other parts of the region. I know people in Iraq who have got into trouble. I know people in Egypt who have been criticized for doing uh, wor work on environmental matters. And the same is, is true about the region. Israel also, when it comes to Israel, a lot of problems are not really well reflected in the international media when it comes to water and environmental problems. The same is true about the rest of the region. We focus and single out some, uh, some, some countries and talk about those and some other countries get away with 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 their you know problems and what they're doing so this is what we need to change information education and and believe a, a strong belief in the fact that an informed society an educated society and an empowered society would have different desired priorities and requests and the governments need to respond no matter how long they have been in power no matter how dictator uh, I mean, how, how much of a dictatorship they right. are. Well, hopefully that will come, as I said, sooner rather than later. Thank you so much Hope for so. being here and sharing some of your insights with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you.
For more information about Professor Madani and his work, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.